Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 105. This episode is with Victor Yared, who is a musician, an actor, a puppeteer, who most recently worked on a little show called uh, The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. You heard me right. Victor puppeteered and voiced Hup, the podling, the paladin, the hero, my favorite character of the show. We talk about how he actually went to school for music first, and then how he uh, got on Sesame Street met another previous guest of the show, Tom Spina, and together he learned the art of puppetry, got better and better. We talk about his favorite Muppet, and then we get into Dark Crystal. It's so good. He has such great stories. We talk about uh, what that audition was like. We talked about learning podling. Victor actually learned podling. How cool is that? We talk about the uh, the joy of throwing puppets across screen. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Uh, he's got a lot of cool stuff going on, guys. Definitely check him out. So let's do this. Let's get right into it. Please enjoy... The Interesting Podcast, episode number 105, with Victor Yared. Theme song time. I saw. I checked out your um your podcast that had a couple of my buddies on there. Oh, you did not um, get out of here. I did. It was great. It had um, stop it. A couple of my uh, age of resistance uh, friends on there. It was yeah. nice. I love puppeteers. They're like the coolest people ever. And uh, well, we, no thanks, exception. Man. No exception. On behalf of all puppeteers, I thank you. Yes, for of that. course. On behalf of all puppeteer fans, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> How's your day going? Good, good, man. Good, good. Yeah. You're in L.A. That's different. Totally I am. would have been in London. Yeah. No, there's a, there were three uh, three of us over there, three Americans. Really? In okay. the puppeteer mix. So. Uh, not bad, not bad. Yeah. You're like the Tim Rose of the Age of Resistance set. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's high yeah. praise. Yeah. I, I, it's funny when you get the behind the scenes and you start looking into it. And that documentary was so good. And it was neat. Like, they did a nice job. Yeah, they did. They did. And the blooper reel is amazing, by the way. Well done. <laughs> well you done. know, there was they did a blooper reel while we were there oh, with sweet. totally different stuff. Really? That I think it was just an in-house, uh, in you know, one. And I wonder because I think that one was done by maybe by Netflix. But there's there's another one that exists somewhere that that was pretty funny, too. Maybe that'll make it out someday. That's amazing. So you're you're American. That's different. That's cool. I am. Right. Yeah. Where are you from? Yeah. Uh, well, I grew up uh, on the East Coast. Cool. And cool. Uh, in uh, Maryland, and and lived All in right uh, Philly and New York for a bit. Um, yeah, and I just moved out here in uh, 2001. I came out here with my wife, and not bad. Not yeah. bad. You doing all right? Doing all right for yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, I love it out here. Well, you know, it's a, it's a Better ridiculous uh, little way to to earn a living you know as a puppeteer you wouldn't think uh, it's you could have an actual career at it but uh that's true i've been super lucky and uh super grateful you know and, and when you start doing it you definitely don't realize how difficult it is because it is art it's a specific kind of art to be able to make a puppet be alive yeah, that's for sure. Wait, by the way, have we started? Are we are we podcasting? This have is we kind began? of the show. Have it, we cast our pod? Oh, we've know. so casted our pod. All it's, right, it's cool. edited later on. But <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. Yeah. Um, sorry. What did you, you just ask me? You're good. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering. Uh, I was saying puppeteering is so difficult to do, and a lot of people I feel like don't really realize how much goes into it. Well, there's so many different disciplines, you know, in puppetry. There's like you know, theater puppetry, and there's a lot of specific forms of that, like tabletop or Bon Raku style puppetry, and there's marionette yeah. stuff. And what we do is very specific to television and film. And oh, the cool. sort of skill set, you know, the sort of skill set that we uh, employ is the one that was kind of pioneered by Jim Henson, which was to use a monitor to watch your performance while it's happening. Right. So we're seeing, yeah, we're seeing everything as it's being performed, um, you know, which is, is good and bad, you know, I mean, it's good because we can 
correct little nuances, little head positions, or if you're seeing too much arm rot or that kind of stuff, Mm -hmm. and you can help frame the puppet. Um, But the the hard part about it is it it gives you like a kind of a hyper awareness of your own performance that's not always good as an actor. I mean, you know, typically when you're acting, you're best when your attention is off of yourself and you're, you know, responding to the other people in the scene and that kind of stuff. So it's this weird sort of duality that happens where you're kind of watching, you know, your own performance and critiquing yourself while trying to be free and spontaneous and organic and do a scene. So it's a, it's, it's a weird, uh, it's a weird little profession. And you need like the most hand-eye coordination ever because you're (laughs) watching it and trying to figure it out with your hand as well as interacting with the person. Yeah. I mean, I think in the beginning, you know, it's like a kind of like a mental labyrinth. You're like, Oh wait, when I move to the right, the puppet goes to the left and you're, kind of like trying to figure out just how the technical part of it works but there's a certain point where it kind of clicks in and all that stuff just kind of becomes second nature and you really do uh, make like little acting choices and things happen that you don't have planned out it just sort of is coming from your brain to your hand to the screen and and you're just kind of watching it as it happens like oh that looked pretty cool I (laughs) I didn't plan on doing that um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting art form, I guess if you call it that. It is commercial puppetry, so I always sort of feel like uh, you know somehow there's more class in people doing like theater puppets, right. with, <laughs> with, you know. But I think Dark Crystal gets kind of close, you know, to to being art because it is a more dramatic, uh, you know, a subject matter and a, and a sort of a richer world that it takes place in. So, you know, I shouldn't snub my nose too much at it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And so Mike Quinn has a Secrets of Puppetry like online course that you can take? Yes. And, yes. Uh, I've been taking it, and this is why I have – I already love puppets and like was amazed at the skill that it takes to operate one correctly. And now I'm like, good Lord. Just like a, a very, very basic understanding of it in practice. It's Yeah. Woo. Yeah, well, it was – you know, like I said, I mean, I, I, I think Jim Henson was certainly the most prolific – Um, within the tv film you know sort of medium so it kind of you know sort of started with him and for the longest time it was really just kind of passed down through the jim henson company and you know you were kind of like a a, not an official apprentice but you kind of like had the role of an apprentice where you were doing um right handing or background puppets for a while as you kind of learn the trade and and then since then it's kind of expanded and, and other people have sort of picked up on it so it's not as um you know, as n- it's not as um, a kept secret anymore. So there, there definitely are classes and things you can take to to kind of learn this stuff. But um, but it is, you know, really the best. You know, the only way to to really, I think, learn this stuff for real, and it's kind of catch twenty two. But is to is to get a job on a show yeah. because once you're in that environment and cameras are moving and they're you know switching or they're you know shooting two cameras at once and that kind of thing, it's a whole nother. Um, sort of world from when you just have a stationary camera kind of set up in your garage or wherever and you're and you're kind of practicing but but all that stuff you know sort of leads you to to being able to do this i mean it's all kind of like steps along the journey i guess sure was that something you always wanted to do puppetry or how'd you get into it no i was actually i was a classical music major i studied really? uh, percussion when i was a kid no yeah way. I, I went to um i went to the curtis institute of music which is this really uh fantastic uh, conservatory in philadelphia and they only accept enough uh students for one orchestra wow so uh so there's about 100 um 100 or so orchestra students here, and then they also have like an opera department and stuff but um but if you get in it's full scholarship it's um Dude. it's a free ride for the tuition so there's a there's a lot of competition to get in and there's a lot a lot of great musicians from around the world so that was was an incredible sort of just um, experience just as an artist to to be part of that sort of dedicated group that was all kind of working towards this this sort of thing of you know, this love of, of classical music um yeah but um but then i you know percussion you a lot of times you're sitting at the back of the orchestra and you stand up and you hit the cymbals and then you sit down and you count a bunch of rests so right so like i was you know i was looking to, to try some other stuff so i took some acting classes and i was taking um improv classes and then i nice. i got a I got an internship at Sesame Street cool. because I, I had gotten into kids' music, and I thought oh, it would be fun to write kids' songs sure. for Sesame Street. So yeah, I, yeah. That, was my first, that was my first TV job, and I, wow. did, uh, I was in the music department. And that's when I first saw the puppets, and I was like, oh, there's another way to perform. So I was really just kind of like 
dabbling in all these different different areas of performing and yeah. and um it turned out that the puppetry the maybe the most unlikely was the <laughs> was the yeah. one that kind of <laughs> stuck and where i where i sort of started getting work and and you know i sort of was able to work my way into this kind of niche little part of the uh performing world wow you learned on sesame street talk about big leagues man for puppetry. well I, well, I I certainly learned something from watching <laughs> the great performance Sesame Street, but I wasn't like on the show. I did eventually puppeteer on it, but I really what happened is I hooked up with this um, other intern there named Tom Spina. Oh, uh, I know Tom. Gosh, yeah, I was gonna say I can't. I, he was on there on your podcast as well, yeah, right? Yeah, Tom's great. Yeah, so so Tom was out in Long Island, and he um, was an internship. Uh, he was an, an intern in Sesame Street, and his internship was ending when mine was was starting. We kind of overlapped a little. I think oh, I met cool. him like his his last day of work, really. And he said, "Hey, I'm working on this thing um, in Long Island. Do you want to come work on it with me?" I was like, "Oh yeah, great." So Tom already was an accomplished builder and a puppeteer, and so he was uh, really probably my first uh, puppetry teacher, um, and kind of showed me. Yeah, he he kind of showed me the the ropes in those early days, and. Um, and uh, when we, and I ended up forming a company with him and two other guys called Sleight of Hand Productions. Incredibly Amazing. clever name. Love it. Uh, so, <laughs> so we did we did some little local stuff, and then eventually, uh, I was I was a van driver. We're well, getting a lot of uh, interesting, bizarre history. Dude, I, I was a show, van man. driver. <laughs> I love it. There was this show, this network called Q2. It was, it was like supposed to be QVC's more upscale shopping network. <laughs> of course. And I was I was driving a van. At the same time as I was an intern uh, at Sesame Street, that was my sort of day job, and I um, I pitched them this idea to put a puppet on because they had a show where they would like sell toys and stuff, kids kids stuff, and I said, well, you know, the puppet won't really sell the stuff, but I can like kind of play the part of a kid and maybe play with stuff and talk to the host. Yeah. And Tom, uh, we used one of Tom's puppets for it, and Tom would come and and build props, and I think he puppeteered on it a little bit as well. But we ended up doing like over three hundred live hour long wow. shows. Um, for this QVC network, which is a, a really fun uh, sort of little entry into this this world, because it was it was non-union, it was low budget, and, and they kind of like let us just do what we wanted. So sure. Tom would build these like incredible costumes and props, and and we just you know had a blast. Like we were young and had all the time in the world, and just you know would make up whatever we thought was funny, and and um, yeah, so that that was a that was a really um, that was a great uh, experience working with him. But yeah, and I I just ran into him at uh, san diego comic-con uh a couple of months ago and, and his his business his uh, replica business is like yeah. unbelievable man it's just such there. gorgeous props and stuff yeah man i didn't realize it was an overlap that's awesome isn't that a fun it's a i mean you know like this whole entertainment world is like such a small it's crazy overlappy right? uh little business you know it's its own little ecosystem that's nuts yeah had no idea that's fun yeah Man, I'm telling so, a dude. So what was what would have been the hardest part to pick up when you're learning puppetry like that? Because it's it's not something that translates for like, you can't do something else. It's like oh, this kind of helped me do puppetry because it's so different, you know. As far as well, the I always I always kind of break it down um, into three. I think I even said this on that documentary too. I I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I but I, right. I always break puppetry down into these th to three categories. When I teach it, it's like it's um, voices, you know, character voices. It's the manipulation of the puppet, mm -hmm. and it's the acting. And of the three, really the acting is the part that's the hardest because, you know, it, it is difficult to learn that technical skill with the monitor. But honestly, it's not brain surgery. And really, you know, enough time spent, anybody can kind of, you, you know, pick, pick it, it up. up to some extent. Mm -hmm. But really what's tricky about about puppetry is the same stuff that's tricky about acting um, as yourself on camera. It's a, It's like – creating a three-dimensional character that's interesting that people sort of care about um and and you know and maintaining that and and you know finding character arcs and especially in like something um you know dramatic like uh like dark crystal where you have to have a little staying power with these characters yeah. it can't just be a goofy voice and and a, and a running around on screen like you really have to have a little depth to it so that's that's always the the trickiest part and then you know, once you have that sort of um, the acting side of it, it's then, okay, now how do I put that into a puppet? What's the puppet version of this move? You know, because the puppets can't do everything that humans do. So a lot of times it's a cheat. You know, you're, sure. you know, you're trying to find the, the puppet version of something. 
Um, so there's there's some figuring out, but re- yeah, really, it's about just creating memorable, interesting characters. I mean, that's that's the tough part. That makes sense. That's like Frank Oz because he's such an incredible actor, and he's talked about that, like rounding out the like he he talks about his, the puppets that he's used and that he's done. He's like, no, they're they're fully fledged like people. He doesn't talk about them like, oh, it's a puppet. Yeah, I mean that guy's in, you know he's in a league by itself. It's kind of like there's yeah. <laughs> there's Frank there's there's Jim Henson. Yep. Who was like the, you know, uh, an amazing puppeteer, but also just creator of of all the, these worlds and these um, characters. And then there's Frank, you know, and and their sort of chemistry as the two of them. Yep. And then there's everybody else. Like there, <laughs> there's there's a big there's a big uh, gap between them and and number three puppeteer, sure. <laughs> you know, uh, whoever that is. But um, but yeah, those those guys really. It's amazing that that they found each other, that, that Jim found Frank right. and that they were able to do, that they were able to come along at a time in television where, you know, you could find your footing. You didn't have to have a hit right. in episode two. Like you could, you know, that you, you watch the first season of the Muppet show and there's some really great fun stuff in there, yep. but it's not like jam packed laughs True. from beginning to end. And, you know, you wonder if something like that would, have survived uh, in today's kind of market. I don't know, totally. but they were given the time to find it. And then, you know, of course with the movies and everything, I mean, I, it's for me still the Muppet movie is like, gold. I don't know, you know, yeah, I don't know how yep. you beat, how you beat something like that, but, but um, it's tough nowadays to, you know, to create something and, and have everybody at the top of their game from like episode one and just, you know, you know, be able to, to really hit it right out of the gate. That's true. And to have, like, with everyone's attention span going so small and so small, it's like for someone to commit to something like that and give it a chance to kind of get up and running and stuff. It's, it's a, Yeah, there has to be that. something. There has to be at least something that kind of grabs him early on. And, and yeah, you know, I think with Frank, like, um, his his characters have depth, you know. Yep. Uh, Miss Piggy has depth. Fozzie yeah. has depth. Like, they're not, they're not just, you know, Fozzie's not just – like a guy who's nervous and and tells bad jokes like he (laughs) you know there's heart in there you know and and i think that's really you know a lot of it is really um getting out of your own way and and allowing the piece of yourself that 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 uh sort of makes that character um uh you know come alive you know allowing that to come through And and i don't know how much formal training uh if any that those guys had i think jim and and frank were just like natural I mean, I you know I, I I've crazy? met uh, Frank Oz on you know once, but I uh, once or twice, but I I don't really know those guys. I didn't really know him, and I never got to meet Jim. But mm-hmm. but um but I wonder if they if uh, if either of them ever had any formal sort of acting training. Sure, that's so crazy that like we live in a time where like they're pioneers of that, right? And that happened within our lifetime to see that. It's nuts. And how far it's come, you know, since yeah. then, you know, again, you know, you look at those early. Sesame Street days and there's a lot of stuff where you can tell like there's one puppeteer with two puppets on so while one is talking the other one kind of goes dead yeah and the the arms are lifeless because they don't have an assist and yeah you know uh, but there, there's still great stuff in there but I mean you get from that to like something like the you know like a the Dark Crystal which you know you have you know 70 puppeteers or, or, yeah. you know working on and by the way i keep mentioning dark crystal i don't i don't know if this is a dark crystal podcast we're talking about or just it's puppetry a, in general it's a victor podcast it's a victor po- all right well then i'm gonna stop referring to that because then it sounds like oh, a broken dude, record we're getting there <laughs> don't, don't you fret we are headed that way my friend <laughs> yeah <laughs> i want to I get to know you that's uh, nuts well Sesame look Street. what do you need to know I want, i'm a guy okay what's your favorite food i do puppets <laughs> 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 better question. All of it. Well, yeah. Better question. What's your favorite puppet's favorite food? Let's dive in deep here. Wow. I know. Uh, Wasn't expecting man. that, were you? I like that's to get you stuff. comfortable and then boom. That's the stuff. <laughs> well, my favorite puppet, first of all, I have to figure out what my favorite puppet is. Right. I think my favorite puppet uh, that uh, is just my own thing is this puppet I do on my uh, – my, uh, by the way, do people curse a lot on your podcast? Yeah, they do. Get comfortable. My, the channel, I'll just start. The channel is called <laughs> Puppets and Shit. Yeah. It specifically, it specifically has profanity in the title. Love it. So that parents know that their kids shouldn't watch it. <laughs> but it's just Fair. a little stupid YouTube channel, YouTube channel that I started. But but there's a character on there called Lucas um, that I like, and uh, there's a little thing called Interviews with Lucas where I where I interview like some. <laughs> 
kind of uh you know celebrities and and friends uh that are in the business but but anyway um genius so lucas maybe maybe is my favorite character uh gosh what does he eat that's right that's a that's We're you going know he's deep. a chipmunk so i'm gonna guess nuts okay fair fair that's i don't good... know that that's ever been proven but yeah i'm gonna guess what he does. Likes. although he does although i do remember one interview where he asked somebody their favorite food, and I think his answer was, "I like Slim Jims and pumpkin pie." <laughs> so maybe that's maybe that's my favorite puppet's favorite food. Wow, that was really back in the recesses yeah. of my brain somewhere. Welcome to the show, Victor. <laughs> this is the realm of nonsense that I operate. <laughs> Amazing. In. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I'm here for I you. I love it. <laughs> I'm curious though. So if you started on Sesame Street making music, and then you made the jump to puppetry, in that setting, which one was harder? Um. In the setting of Sesame Street, you mean? Yeah, sir. Or, well, um, you know, I don't know that I really did either of those things uh, at, at Sesame Street. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was in the music department wanting to write songs, but I wasn't writing songs. I was, you know, uh, doing office work. I was uh, oh, copying cool. over lead sheets and, and you know, uh, just supporting the, the music staff. And then puppetry, I did get to work a couple days on Sesame Street. Um, but I certainly was never, you know, like a, a, a cast puppeteer or anything. So, mm-hmm. uh, they were both pretty easy cause I didn't really do much of either, There you go. but, but in life, uh, you know, to me, it's all kind of interwoven. Like, you know, I, a lot of shows I work on the kid shows, especially we sing songs and, and, um, so, so my music background definitely plays into it. I bet. Um, and so it all it all feels it doesn't feel like separate elements to me. It just feels like different, uh, you know, different. Um, I wish I was uh, lived in the country and had some good uh, good expression to say right now. It's like different. <laughs> it's like it's like a whole bunch of different heads of the same nuclear fish. Yeah, that's not right. really. Yeah. That's not an expression. Yeah. I don't know what that was. It's like different but kinds of corn, but it's all corn at the end of the day. It's it's <laughs> exactly. It's like you know different toenails. That's right. On a foot. That's not really <laughs> yeah. none of that. None of that is good. And I'll, is I'll take good. it. This is the tagline now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that should be the name of your memoir. It's yeah. Slight, sleight of hand and different toenails on the same foot. Different toenails on the same foot. I'll That's what it. life is. I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> but it needs to be written in podling, so we'll we'll, we'll meet you halfway. <laughs> yeah, we could do that. <laughs> oh, I think. Man. Were you? Have you ever uh, like puppeteered a Muppet? Uh, yeah. In fact. Um, so back in, I want to say 2005, maybe, um, the, the story that I heard uh, is that John Fiedler, uh, who performed Piglet, got sick, oh. and they didn't have like a backup Piglet on hand, a backup voice guy. So Disney kind of uh, panicked a little and decided that they needed backups of many of them, of all their characters. And they had, they had uh, just gotten the, acquired the Muppets uh, not long before then. So there was a while where they were, they had a backup sort of training program uh, for the main Muppets. Ultimately the, the main puppeteers um, did not want a, a backup program. So it kind of went away, but for a short time there, um, they were kind of training people to do these other characters. So I got to do Miss Piggy and I got to do Fozzie Bear and Swedish Chef and Dr. Teeth. And I did Waldorf. Statler. In fact, there was a show on the Internet Sweet. called From the Balcony. This was this was like one of the early webisode days before there were, were all these streaming platforms. Yeah. But we did a bunch of episodes of From the Balcony um, with uh, myself as Waldorf and Drew Massey as Statler. So we were not the we were not the main guys who who do those characters but they had like kind of a b-team uh show which was really fun and like again like it was just a cool sort of training ground back in those early days to you know to do and and besides those characters we did a ton of like other original characters that we had created just for you know for that series so it was a it was a whole lot of fun but yeah i got to do a bunch of those characters that's cool are they heavy yeah no, in fact, the Muppets and the Jim Henson Company puppets in general are really some of the the most well built puppets uh, you'll ever work on. So they're so they're they're typically super light and flexible and move well. And yeah, the Muppets are all uh, designed, you know, for puppeteers and by, and you know by uh, the the workshop in the, in its kind of heyday. So so yeah, they're great great puppets, not heavy. 
Although I'm sure some of them, I got some of them must be. Right. I don't think I ever put on Sam the Eagle, but he seemed like he'd be a heavy puppet. Yeah, I don't know. I think so too. Most of them, most of them seem pretty, pretty reasonable though. How is you said you did Swedish Chef? How does that work? Because those are real people hands. Those are real people hands. So there's when I did it, it was me. I was doing the head and the voice, and then uh, Drew Massey, who I think also did it for for the the uh, Muppets. I think when Bill Beretta was doing Swedish Chef. Um, but Drew would do both hands uh, at the same time, oh. and uh, and you know always with the Swedish Chef, even when it was um, you know originally done with Jim and Frank. I think, I think it's there's many sort of stories about this, but I think Frank kind of did his own thing and would try to throw Jim Henson off or make him laugh <laughs> or you know make things fun by just grabbing stuff and chucking them. So, sure. oh. so the hands are always kind of a wild card in in any uh, Swedish Chef scene. They just sort of do their own thing. That's so cool. Do you have a favorite Muppet? Favorite Muppet. I love Fozzie Bear. Fozzie's I mean, I think, great. you know, he just, uh, man, you just want him to succeed so badly. <laughs> and he's just never going to do it. No. <laughs> he's never going to make it. But, uh, yeah, he's a good one. He'll never give he's up, though. One. He'll never give up. Good for yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. That's Fozzie. He's all heart. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I always like the like the gags with, like, the full bodies. Of the Muppets, like, uh, I have it etched in my brain. It was in Muppets Take Manhattan. Yeah. And the one where Animal is, like, stuck in the door frame. And right. I, I always think of that. So anytime I see a Muppet's feet, I'm like, whoa, how? Well, and, and like, for me, um, I loved, I mean, I think some of the best, the Muppet movie is probably my favorite, but the Muppet caper, oh, yeah. there's just some great puppetry in there. And then, like, climbing up the side of the of the uh, house, John Cleese's house. Yeah. <laughs> that they're, I think, was that, no, sorry, no, that wasn't John. It's Piggy's climbing up to John Cleese's house. But then they're like, they're breaking in somewhere. I can't remember. But they're, it's a bunch of Muppets climbing up the side of a building, mm -hmm. full body. And that was really cool. But also like the whole, um, was that whole swimming underwater sequence? That was Muppet Caper too. Yep. Um, with Miss Piggy doing the um, synchronized swimming and like that whole dance thing. Like that just stuff to me is like, how? That's like just puppetry. Again, you know, it's it was the company at its at its height, you know, really just doing that. That was like the best of the Muppets for me. Um, was that kind of that era there? Fair. Do you yeah. does does getting jobs as a puppeteer? Are there auditions like going for regular acting gigs as well? Uh, th there's absolutely auditions uh, for for puppet jobs, and and you know that's really the same as as anywhere um, where you go in and you perform and sometimes usually you're you're performing the puppet and doing the voice at the same time sometimes it's just a voice audition but and there are auditions you know when you've kind of been in the business for a while there you'll get called for jobs sure. um you know without having to audition but but yeah just same as uh same as you know regular acting sometimes you get offers sometimes you audition your way in you know yeah that makes sense that makes sense so i mean we got to we got to dive in dark crystal man it's yeah. Ooh, it's so good. Oh, thank you. Well, I, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people that, that yeah. contribute. So I sh I'd say thank you on behalf of all of them, not, yes. uh, not just me. <laughs> of course. But also just you. Amazing work. <laughs> it's, oh, it's, well, kind of you to say, man. Man. Like, cause that, that's an iconic movie. You know, it's Jim Henson's baby. Yeah. Uh, Frank Oz's directorial debut. Right. right. And uh, somehow. You guys made a series that made the movie ten times better, which is just well, nuts. I think everybody working on it um, felt this uh, onus to to kind of you know pay homage to the original, and I think we were all such fans of the original that nobody wanted to screw it up. You know, we just like <laughs> wanted to you know to make a series that kind of live up to lived up to that and, and at least felt like you were in the same world of Thra. And, you know, for me, like, I mean, it just, it starts with, it starts with two things. I mean, first of all, you know, the design sensibility, we had Brian Frout. So, yeah. so it was like, you already had that consistency there, yep. um, which was, which was amazing. So the look we knew was going to be what it should look like. But um, the, the big thing was the writing. I mean, we did, we read through all 10 episodes in Los Angeles, we did them. We did them on two separate days. We'd read five one day and five another day, and those are long, really? you know, scripts. That's a that's a big session to read yeah. through five 
hour long scripts. And I got to tell you, man, I was on the edge of my seat having not read these scripts, you know, and just kind of reading them cold. Like it just takes so many turns and it's so exciting and interesting. So they just, I feel like just knocked it out of the park with the writing. And in, in particular, with the writing of, of my character, I just, yep. man, I just love, it's like a dream job. You know, they're, they're like, okay, you're going to play this, this little podling who wants to be a paladin and he protects this girl, even though he's like small and he gets thrown around by the hunter. I'm like, you can't, you know, you it's can't true. be, there's no way to go wrong with this character. It's a dream. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah, dream, dream job for sure. And he gets a spoon. It's like, there's two, he gets a there's spoon. two dreams. <laughs> I mean, the spoon, that, that makes it all the better. That's what I'm saying. That's the real flavor there. Now, do you, how, <laughs> how many spoons did they go through? Had to have been a lot. Well, let's see. I mean, Hero Spoons, you know, he starts with his first spoon. Yep. Classic. And it gets broken, it gets broken in the third episode. Mm -hmm. And so there was a broken version of it. And then he gets his more uh, uh, ladle-shaped spoon. And then he grabs he grabs a giant spoon to a third <laughs> spoon to uh, kind of block the hunter. Great. But um, but that uh, that uh, we don't know what happens after that. I don't know. if I guess he goes back to his ladle spoon. I don't think he's going to carry that big one around with him. I think that was a one time only. Yeah, uh, a one time spoon. only. Specific. It was a hunter um, spoon. <laughs> and there's a there's these comics coming out which I don't know anything about the stories of than I know that hops in them. But maybe we'll learn, we'll learn more about his background and find out, uh, you know, if he worked in a kitchen, sure, or uh, <laughs> or what. I mean, I think all the podlings are kind of, uh, they're kind of like this helper, helper race of, uh, you know, creatures that, you know, they probably all cook, a little bit, yeah, uh, you know. So, so I don't, I don't know. They like I, to I, eat. I can't wait to find out uh, where where it all comes from. Agreed. I think podlings, podlings <laughs> were my favorite part of the first movie. And so when there were podlings here, and I was like, oh, there's a podling character that's like coming along? I was so hyped. What, oh, yeah, man. What, yeah, me too. What was that? What's that kind of audition like? Because you're the voice and the puppeteer. That's right. Well, so they, for Hup, they, um, they had the script, mm -hmm. and it would have the, it said that he speaks in, in gibberish, podling, yep. and then they would just basically give you the English. So, so for the, for the audition, it was all improvised. It was all making up, oh, cool. um, you know, a, a gibberish language that kind of sounded right. And I, I, you know, of course watched the, the original a bunch and, you know, to me, it kind of, what always sticks out in my mind is I hear Jerry Nelson's voice. Oh, yeah. He was doing this. It sounded like kind of vaguely Italian. Like when she first gets, they first get to the Pauling village. Right. I just hear his voice going, Kira, minya, Kira. Yeah. You know, and, and so that, that always kind of stuck in my head. And so I kind of did my sort of impression of that. But the funny thing is the job ended up not really being that at all because they wrote an entire podling language. And so none of what I said in the in the show is improvised. Oh. Um, I would I would add in little sounds or I'd have like a few phrases that I could that I could throw in as like, you know, as he's getting dragged out or something, you know, like I, that all wasn't scripted necessarily, mm -hmm. but it was all real real podling words i wasn't like making anything up so so the actual job was was totally different but um uh but yeah it was it was so fun to kind of uh dive into this you know into this whole language and try and try and you know as much as i could become fluent in uh in this language that i had nobody to speak to it and there was no yeah. <laughs> nobody else to speak podling to so you know we did the best we could dude that's another thing that I love about the show is, like, the amount of detail. Like, you can see how much work went into it. Like, it comes across on, on screen. And, like, dude, a podling language. You learn a podling language. That's, like, Dothraki <laughs> and Game of Thrones, like, Klingon. Yeah. You know? Well, they sent me they sent me a, this, this video, this Conlang video. I can't think of the, the name of the guy who breaks them all down, but he, he talks about these different languages. And I was like, oh, that's cool. But the truth is, you know, my family, I have, uh, my wife and my three little daughters Amazing. Um, were, were over here while I was in London working. So I, I was away from them. So I just had all kinds of free time. So I had nothing to do but uh, <laughs> learn podling and read uh, books, you know, uh, old books about the, the Dark Crystal, like – the, the, all the different spin-off books and and everything. So I really had the time to kind of immerse myself in that in that world and sort of you know uh, 
you know, delve into all the, the, the silly little details of words and things. I think I probably drove Joe Lee nuts because I would email him. <laughs> I would email him all the time and ask him, I was like, dude, I'm doing a scene uh, in like an hour. And um, I want to say this, but it's really, it's, uh, I, can, I only want to have like one or two English words. Can I, can I say it this way? And then, you know, he'd like, whatever time it was, you know, where he was <laughs> three in the morning, he'd, <laughs> he'd like email me back like, well, you know, it doesn't really make grammatic sense of this way. So how about this? And I was like, yeah, but uh, I'd rather, you know, can I have this there too? So I, I was, you know, he, he was great, man. He's, he really was uh, always there to answer my silly language questions, but I, you know, but the truth is I wanted it to be authentic and I, I yeah. felt like it helped, it helped ground me um, to make that as real as possible. <clears throat> you know, it helped, it helped, um, it helped me with the, you know, with making the performance come to life to, to be really saying something, to have those words really mean something and not just, you know, sort of going off the cuff with it. I think, I think it gives it, uh, again, you're always looking at ways to give it depth. Absolutely. Man, did it take you a long time to learn it? Well, I mean, I was only learning, you know, what, what, what did we do is we'd, we'd learn enough for the scene that we were doing that day, you know, Mm -hmm. but then I had like this packet, which was like, it was just words. So I was really became a memory exercise. Like I memorized all the A's. Oh, and then cool. I memorized the B's and the C's and the D's. And then by the time it got to the E's, like I'd forgotten the A's. <laughs> so I'd like go back. And I think I made it all the way through. And there was a time where I could, I, I knew all the words from A through K. And then I was like, ah, oh, this is, this is just taking forever. I'm going to go to the Z's. I'm going to go to the Z's and start working <laughs> backwards. <laughs> so, but I think my, my brain could only hold so much before it would push other stuff out. So I, I, I don't have it all memorized, but I, I know a few, uh, I know, uh, you know, the important phrases. Sure. Sure. How is, so with like Sesame street and other like puppeteer gigs, a lot of times you're with actual people on set and they're interacting with the puppets, right? Whereas, like, uh, right, yes, on a lot of other like strictly puppeteer sets, you've got like the stage above you, and then you're walking through these like little alleyway things. I've, right. I've always been curious, how is it done with a person there interacting with the puppet? Is the person on the like platform above you and you're below? Like, how does that work? Well, it, it all depends. Like, there's different things. Like, for example, if you're in a real world environment, like we'll do man on the street interviews where you're a- actually outside in the real world. Right. Well, then we have like little rolling carts and things. So you're down low oh. and you're you kind of always want the puppet's waist to end up about where the person's waist is. Even if it's even if it's like a little short puppet, you mm-hmm. don't want them where they'd really be down by the person's you know ankles. You'd, you'd still kind of cheat it so that their waists are always about in the same place so that that's the cut point for the camera, you know, the bottom frame. So so that's one one way is to have the puppeteer in a little cart. And, and then, you know, like uh, uh, shows that are more heavily puppet, like uh, the Muppet Show, for example, mm-hmm. they could have the guests up on like little risers um, where, where the humans are up on a – a higher platform because it's it's on a stage it's it's not a real world environment so so we kind of do both of those things and then for like the dark crystal um the whole set was made of these little platforms that they call rostrums oh. which were little like four by four sections of wood and, and you could take out any of these sections or even half of a section um so that the puppeteer could stand through the floor and then if it was a skexy a full body skexies mm-hmm. um then that person would be standing on the four foot um rostrum so so you'd be in the hole next to them or and that was for like the the people that did the full body skexies were a little shorter than than the puppeteers that would do them so so i think most of the performers were probably around five 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 six maybe a little less mm-hmm. um and then if it was a puppeteer inside where you've got your arm up over your head then they would pull out those rostrums and they put in a little platform that made you only two feet lower than the deck so it was like a little bit of math like where does the waist end up what looks right in this particular shot but oh. but yeah we kind of do all different configurations of whatever people works. standing on the ground people standing on a two-foot platform people standing on a four-foot platform yeah it's like whatever it, it all kind of is based on the the world that you're that you're shooting that's cool so how often did you run into those wooden banisters or other people <laughs> um you know i mean every day i guess yeah. you're probably just running into stuff constantly just for good but measure. <laughs> uh but you know that usually uh people are pretty kind about uh rounding off the edges or you know That's getting good. rid of screws that are sticking out <laughs> every once in a while you find a screw sticking out and you're like hey 
did you guys take this out? It hurts a little when it yeah. pierces my That's skin. That's how you find it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I don't think there was any real traumatic injuries over there. I think we all that's managed good. to come out uh, pretty unscathed. I think we're legally not allowed to talk about those, though. Well, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really what I meant. How long was, <laughs> how long was that shoot? Uh, we were in London for just about 11 months. Wow. And so it was like a three-week uh, rehearsal slash troubleshooting uh, period, and then basically a month an episode. That's about what we got, which is an incredible luxury, yeah. uh, especially you know in television. Um, it was really more like 10 mini movies than it was like a TV show. Agreed. Um, you know, so we, so yeah, you know, about a month an episode, I think we took. That's amazing. Nuts. Is, how is Hup as a puppet? Is he heavy? No, he's light. In fact, um, I was, I was, uh, so, uh, you know, lucky like the other guys were like, you know, holding up these gelflings that had like all these mechanics in their heads and, and, you know, you know, doing take after take after take, and uh, and they're like, you know, you guys need a rest. And I'm like, no, I'm good. Let's go. Yeah, yeah feeling great. Because <laughs> uh, mine, mine was definitely the lightest, smallest puppet. But he's also, you know, he's a great, really well built puppet and like a really flexible, um, you know, fun mouth and and you know, you can get a lot of expression. And what I loved about performing him was um, that I got to perform his eyes, his his eye blinks and his eyes oh. open wide and his looking left, right, and squinting. I did all that from a little controller that was mounted on the left arm rod. What? So all of the, yeah, so so it was like all of the timing for all of my expressions was was exactly when and how I wanted it to be. For, for better or for worse, it was all my performance um, in the face. Whereas um, with a lot of the Gelfling and other characters, it would be, you'd be working in tandem with somebody. Somebody would be doing, the facial animation while, you know, somebody else was doing that, the mouth and the voice and stuff. So it was fun to, to have that control over, over, uh, you know, the whole performance. Sure. Goodness. I, cause I was wondering that cause Hup had some really good facial expressions. Yeah. Blinking. I was like, is that, is that in the hand? Are you doing with your right? You have the, wow. So Hup is, Hup is through and through you. Um, yeah, I mean, no, look, I, <laughs> I had plenty of help and assist like, um, Kat Smee, who was one of our core puppeteers, she was my main assist in the early days, and then everybody started stealing her because she's so good. <laughs> and so, uh, you Fair. know, I had I had um, uh, Daisy Beatty and um, Yvonne. Uh, boy, I'm blanking on Yvonne's last name, but but I had some great assists uh, come come help me out um, over the over the course of the show. And then, you know, if you ever saw his feet, there'd be another person doing feet. So. Oh, so yeah. it was definitely it was definitely a a, t, uh, a group effort, but but yeah, it was nice to to like I say control his uh, his uh, facial his facial movement his eyes you know sure and your voice is in the final cut and, your and my voice is in there man it was amazing you know I we knew going in they they were planning on replacing a lot of the of the voices right um, and we didn't know that they were going to replace as many as they did oh. um, but. Mine was one that they they talked about keeping my voice early on. They certainly never promised me that it would be my voice. Sure. But they talked about keeping my voice. And, and the voice that I was doing for the first nine months of the shoot is very different than what's in the actual no way. thing. Because because I, I thought I was just doing this kind of like – it was just kind of like my own voice but maybe a little higher – Mm -hmm. You know, and and he would say J J Pudling Justista. You know, but it was like it was just kind of like me. Yeah. But then, like about nine months in, you know, I I got the message that they were like not really loving the voice, and I was like, oh god, Uh oh, they're gonna replace me. They're gonna replace me. (laughs) Um, So so we tried a bunch of different voices, and we found one, you know, that kind of raspy, um, Yetabo voice that they that they liked (laughs) uh, that they liked, and so so we um. We settled on that, and and that and that seemed to work. But yeah, that was all. You know, all all the voices were were dubbed in in post in ADR. But but I was so uh, so pleased that, that that I was able to keep my voice in there, just because, you know, for me, I I feel like I'm proud of my manipulation, like my puppetry. But mm-hmm. you know, the acting and the voice and everything. You know, being able to have that sort of complete package. That's kind of for me the soul of the of the puppet. So, so when, when they dub, when they dub you over in some ways, it, it kind of, you know, erases, erases your performance to some extent. So, sure. So, um, it's, it was nice to have that in there. Although in this show in particular, um, 
because the puppeteers lay down the the voice while they're puppeteering, it's really more the the voice actors that are kind of locked into the puppeteers acting right. than the other way than the other way around. So so you do you do still what you're even though you're not hearing the puppeteers, you are getting their their acting performance in there, which is nice. I love that. That was my favorite yeah. thing about the behind the scenes documentary was when the uh, voice actors were talking about that. They're like the puppeteers would make these character decisions, and we'd be like, "Oh, okay." And then they would have to cater to the decisions you guys made. That that yeah, cool. it's true. It's true. And and you know they were um, the Henson Company was smart, and they cast really good uh, puppeteers that were good actors. And and um, you know I don't know if British people are better actors than us, or if it's just <laughs> impressive because they have British accents. Very possible. I'm so like. They must have been working in the theater for years. They're so good at this dramatic right? material. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's just you know we're just impressed with British people or what. But the but the guys way. that they got, the guys and the girls that they got, um, uh, or I should say, men and women that they got were were just uh, you know super talented actors and and funny and and it was just a really strong uh, core cast uh, of puppeteers that we had. Yeah, and it came through. It came through. It's so cool. What? Yeah, in thanks, this, man. So when. <laughs> When there's scenes of like crazy action, like you know, Hup getting thrown across the room, how is that done? Yeah, do they just throw the puppet and film it? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> they have a stunt. They have a. That's pretty much it. That's the magic. Yeah, there we the go. The magic of the movies. Um, yeah, wonder. there's a stunt. There's a stunt version of Hup um, that you know they put armature wire inside so that you know the arms and legs sort of you know stay out. You can bend them, you know, sure. and pose them. But, but yeah, I. Uh, yeah, when a puppet goes flying, usually somebody's throwing it. And I love throwing puppets. I love throwing <laughs> props. So whenever, whenever you know, they have a scene like that, I'm always like, well, let me know when they're going to throw them because I want to do that part. <laughs> you know, because I, I really, yeah. And in fact, there was, uh, there when they were doing uh, where he's defending Deet yes. uh, by the brew trough, there's, he has this big leap uh, where he jumps on the guys and, and um, and I I was like in the green room and I heard that they were about to do it. And I was like, what? And I ran out to set and they had someone else, uh, uh Someone else ready to do the throwing. I was like, no, it's okay. I got it. I got it, guys. Yeah. I'll do it. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Hup, hup, hup coming through. Excuse me. Excuse and me. It, it's not even. It's not even like a territorial thing. Like I don't want someone else to do my character. I just really, I like really it. enjoy throwing <laughs> the puppets. It's really fun. In fact, I got to throw one of my favorite things. I got to throw Rianne. Um, there's a scene where the hunter, in um, I think it's the last episode where the hunter comes. Um, He's just come back to life, and he he um, shows up at Stone in the Wood, and he grabs Rianne, and he runs, and he throws him, and he kind of rolls up the the steps of the of the uh, the the little Stone in the Wood. Uh, uh, I don't know what it's called, the headquarters, the chamber. What do they call that? Yeah, yeah. The castle, the the, the yeah, the castle, the building, the yeah. thing, the atrium. I don't know. Yeah, uh, but that. <laughs> but there's there was that, and and um and Nick uh, Kellington, who who played the hunter, he yeah. did this amazing thing where he ran in this full costume he could barely see and he threw through the puppet and he did he was like really good but for whatever reason the angle of the camera they wanted another version of it and they wanted me to kind of match what he had done and his had like rolled really fiercely across <laughs> the ground and like rolled up the steps halfway and then like came back down and i was like whoo that's challenging <laughs> but uh but i was able to kind of match it and and that was i mean i oh my god i love that stuff it was so much fun that's hilarious. i wish i could do that all day yeah i wonder if there's a job in my future where i'm just I just throw the puppets. Like that's all yeah. I do. <laughs> I'll make a few calls. <laughs> yeah, I'd love it. Is there? I'd so, come work for you. Is there? Is there a technique to it? Is there a special way you have to throw a puppet? Well, um, you know, that's funny you asked that. No one's ever asked me that before. Thank I, you. I <laughs> do. I do. You know, think about. Okay, you know, in the in the case of the of uh, the fight in the brew trough, he's diving headfirst to attack these guys. So you want it to fly straight you don't want it to go end over end right sure so in that case i think i was grabbing it by the toe or the waist and had one hand under the front shoulder so that i could get all the power from my my backhand but like keep the head up when i let go of it so he would basically dive forward right Beautiful. but then like the rianne one he had to roll up the stairs a certain way. So I like curled him up more like a bowling ball and like kind of released him. So he would be rolling the direction that would go part way up the stairs and then rolled back. Yes. Yeah, so I guess there is, there is a little technique that goes into it, but it's, it's really more about where does the puppet need to enter the frame? So I can't, I can't go past that plane cause you don't want to see my hand. So how close can I get to the edge of frame 
to have the most control over the throw possible. And then at what, what angle does this puppet need to come out? Does it need to go up? Does it need to go straight? Um, so yeah, you know, you try and figure all that stuff out and, and make it look good, but there you go. Sometimes you just chuck it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sometimes you just try. I think I threw the Grunyak, the Grunyak too into the crystal chamber. Oh, sweet. Uh, when, uh, when the uh, scientist throws him over the wall, I think that's my work as well. There you go. I'm going to start keeping tally. Be like, that is definitely a Victor Yared throw. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to cut together a reel. You should. Of puppet <laughs> Just throws. Flying puppets. <laughs> to see if I can get, yeah. see if I can get my new career started. That's right. <laughs> I'll blast it. Let me know. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> that's so funny. What a, that's, so do you, do you usually have to do that? Like take after take? Cause I remember, yeah. like, I remember there was a thing that they did. It was a, it was a Henson production. It was like Mrs. Otter's Christmas, something like that. There's a really uh, like Emmett bl- Otter's yes. Jug Band. Uh, that yeah. one. So there's the. Have you seen that blooper reel? Where it's like the, yeah, I, the drum. I think I have. His, they'd have to do like 15 takes of trying to get this drum to come flying out and land in a yeah. specific place. So I, just I picture remember that. that. I picture that with just puppets well, flying. <laughs> you know, there's um, you know, there's it. All, it depends on the show and the budget and how much time you have. You know, the Dark Crystal. No matter what the shot was, we were going to do a ton of takes of it. Love Even it. if you got it right and got it perfect on the first one, um, we were going to do a bunch of takes just so they had variety in the edit and coverage and different right. you know looks that they could pick from. Safety. Um, but sometimes it is about getting it right. And what there, you know, there's um, I don't know if you ever watch Breaking Bad, but there's oh, yeah. there's a, there's a thing where he throws a pizza and it lands up on the roof. Oh yes. I don't remember is that second or third season, but but. Uh, I remember hearing him talk about that. Brian Cranston was talking about that, and he said, "You know, that was in one take, and it just like it just happened that way. It was like luck of the draw. What? So sometimes you get it, you know, you get it right on the first time, and it looks good, and everybody's like, great. If the director is confident that that that's the shot they need, then you move on. And but yeah, Dark Crystal, pretty guarantee, pretty much guarantee we we're going to do tw- about twenty throws of anything. AKA uh, best you know. days ever." Oh my God! Best days, <laughs> best, best days of my life. Which, which which puppet of yours is the most aerodynamic that you threw? Wow, gosh! Now, I mean, we're talking about like like lifetime career or Let's do it. just Let's dive Dark in. Crystal. I mean, Dark Crystal, you know, hop light, small. He's pretty good. Certainly uh, good for the chucking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but lifetime, gosh! I'll tell you the most fun I've ever had. It wasn't actually throwing a puppet. It was throwing snowballs, and it was on oh. this this show, uh, that same show that I mentioned um, uh, from the balcony, the Statler and Waldorf show we did. Oh, sweet. And we did an episode where there was this photographer in the bushes, and he would poke his head out, and Drew was doing the photographer, Drew Massey was doing it, and I would I had to hit him with these, like, snowballs in the face and they the i don't know who made the snowballs or prop guy made them and they were like but they were like ice like slushy but they would like stay together and they would just explode on impact <laughs> and it just cracked me up every time i hit him in the face because drew's reaction like he'd like kind of be startled and like get back behind the bush again and we just did it over and over I, if i i'd never <laughs> laughed so hard i think in my life that that was the i'm definitely have to put that one on on the reel uh, on my throw, my throw reel because, <laughs> yeah. oh my god, that that was a that was a good time. He's got to open and close the reel with those. Yeah, <laughs> Just yeah. Snowball. <laughs> if I could, if I could do it like where the the snowball explodes, and then it like somehow white it like wipes to like my name, Beautiful. like against white. You know what I mean? That's like yeah. the open of my reel <laughs> or the close. I don't know. How do you decide? That's right. Well. Why not both? I'm into it. <laughs> That's amazing. Good job throwing snowballs at your friend. Does it get better? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. I feel like it does I think that was the height of my career. I didn't realize it at the time, but you look back yeah. at your body of work. <laughs> That's and right. I think that was it. That's the service I, I provide. I look back on all the cool stuff you've done and be like, wasn't that neat? That's, <laughs> that's funny, though. Well, we're grateful that you're here to do that. Yeah. Ha- has your arm ever gone numb in a puppet? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, you keep your arm up in the air and naturally the, the blood drains out and you know depending on how long you're going or what you know your setup is sometimes you 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 just have to keep it up there you don't want to break especially if it's like something live or like if you're in a couch or you know through some weird hole where there's it's hard to get you out of it then you just got to kind of suffer 
<laughs> suffer through the pain and and uh you know i've never like uh lost a, a limb or anything but uh definitely uh There's definitely gone numb that's for sure yeah, yeah you know you're right you gotta open, be open to opportunities you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i always wonder that with your hand up i was like because it's it's hours it's not like you do that for 15 minutes and then you're yeah open. but you know the sort of the sort of way you know that that it kind of works best is you you keep your arm up and you do a scene and as soon as they yell cut um, you drop it down and you kind of get the blood back in because you don't, you don't want to push it to where you start to shake. I mean, you can, if you need to get a shot or you're doing something live, but once you get to that point, then it takes longer for your muscles to recover. So you kind of, oh, you know, you've been point. doing it, you've, you know, you've been doing it long enough. You get to that point where you recognize that the fatigue is starting in and you, you know, as soon as you get a chance, you, you take that break and you, you know, kind of uh, recoup so you can do it again and again. Sure. What's the heaviest puppet you've worked with? Heaviest puppet. Well, I would say I would say the Ritual Master Ooh. on the Dark Crystal was definitely the heaviest head that I ever did. But I did do I did do one commercial. It was a weird commercial for this company called Heiwa. H e i w a. It's a Japanese company. Oh, nice. And they had they had a lion, oh. an animatronic lion, and an animatronic zebra in the desert. And I was <laughs> all right inside the zebra beautiful holding up this head and the head had really heavy mechanics in it and i was i just i mean that thing was like a was a monster i, I maybe that was the heaviest but it's but uh, of 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 my work that anybody has ever seen probably the ritual master yeah i don't know if that zebra <laughs> really made it into the public uh pop culture That's lexicon right. i heard the lion went on to great things though you know. Blind, yeah, he had a great career. <laughs> uh, things really took off for him after that. But Zebra, not so much. What are oh, you going to do? man. Yeah, what are you going to do? Mi- you did a Mystic, too. That's cool. Uh, I did not do a Mystic. You just uh, went in it. I, uh, oh, sorry. Did I say a Mystic? No, Ritual Master. Ritual Master. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I did do a photo shoot uh, with, uh, with the Wanderer, the Blue Mystic, and uh, that was fun. That was pretty cool to to be inside there, but but uh, yeah, I don't know if my promo uh, <laughs> wanderer picture will will uh, ever make it out there. It may be on the cutting room floor with that zebra somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's its own vault knows? next to the folder <laughs> of all the throws. You, what? So what is it about puppetry that you like? I I remember talking to Mike Quinn. He said he sees puppets as like live action cartoons. And that's where like his kind of love came from. It. What is it for you? You know, I mean, that's a really uh, that's a really uh, great way of putting it. Um, and it is. It's like a cartoon that's come to life. Especially, I mean, my favorite way to see puppets is in the real world. Yeah. Um, you know, and and so when when they're in that setting, it is it is like a like an animation that's alive. But I guess I guess um, you know what I love about it is you can do it a real extreme range of characters i can do a little old man and a little kid and a monster and and go through a whole range of voices and um and and it, and it not really be like me in some weird prosthetic like trying to like it takes a lot more for gary oldman to to really transform right and play all these different characters um than for me to just throw on a different puppet and do a different voice you know what i mean so so there's 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 a nice freedom in that, and and I think puppets can get away with with a little bit more, especially in like the comedy Definitely. sort of world. You know, you can you can um, play with people in a way that you that you really can't do as a as a human. You know. Yeah, that's true. It's u- using the vehicle of a puppet. You got way more leniency, <laughs> more freedom. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's and it's fun. Puppets are fun and stupid, and you I know, agree. I love them. Me too. Me too. On Dark Crystal. What was like? Were there any technically difficult days for you? Because it just looks like a lot of work in general. I mean, I think every day was a technically difficult yeah. day, <laughs> you know, on that show. But but certainly the the Gelfling. Any any time I was doing a Gelfling, yeah. Um, those puppets are just um more difficult to um to make look real. Uh, there's a real fine line with the Gelfling between. If you move it too much, it looks puppety. If you don't move it enough, it looks like a dead doll. Yeah. Like you, it's it's really hard to find that that zone and kind of stay in it um, where they look good, um, because they are they are the most uh, close to human looking. So Definitely. so 
you know, it, it is hard to kind of, um, to find that with them sometimes. And, and so that's, that, that was really the, the trickiest stuff. And, and, um, and yeah, there sometimes you'd be long days or battle scenes where you're doing a, a gelfling all day and there's like dirt bombs going off around you and you've got a, you know, s- smoke mask on and, and, uh, protective, you know, eye goggles and, you know, th- those days were, those days were tough, but I mean, it's tough relative to, you know, I'm earning my living playing with puppets. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's not really it's tough. Fair. It's just, it's just tough based on the other fun days that I had at work. Really. Right. Right. You know? That's funny. What, so yeah. what, what advice would you give to somebody who wanted to get into puppetry? Well, I think, you know, the, the practical advice is, is to, and if you're, if you're interested in the type of puppetry that, that I do, mm-hmm. which is the, the, um, TV and film sort of a monitor style puppetry is just to get a camera and hook it up to your TV and, and practice at home. You know, lip syncing to songs is always good. Oh, um, nice. doing little nursery rhymes, um, just anything to get your puppet talking. You know, if you, you want to film little scenes, you know, start a YouTube channel, like just do your own thing. But, but really that monitor work, um, you can certainly practice that stuff. Um, you can't practice that stuff too much. So, so right. I think doing that till it, till it feels comfortable. And there's, there's so many great little YouTube channels and things out there nowadays that you can, you know, kind of watch for inspiration and come up with your own little bits and things. But, um, the sort of more general career advice, which, which really kind of applies to any field is to find somebody in that's doing what you're doing or doing what you want to do and doing it well. Mm -hmm. and um you know try and get someone to to help mentor you a little bit you know if you can get on a on a show or be around a show and and talk to somebody that's working on it and maybe come on as an assistant trying to learn from the people that have that have been doing it i mean it is really one of those things that just kind of gets passed down you know from from generation to generation i think to some extent and so you know i i always i always tell people to seek out mentors that are that are uh in the field that they want to be in, but not me because I am super busy. I cannot, <laughs> I cannot mentor anybody. That's right. Right that's now. Right. Yeah. Legally. Derek Arnold. You can Derek, find Derek. Yeah, let's, th- yeah, let's throw Derek. <laughs> he will, he will mentor the shit out of that's you. That's right. If I know one he's person who doesn't do anything, it is Derek. Arnold. Yeah. He's got tons of free time. <laughs> so much free time. And loves mentoring people. It's his favorite thing. <laughs> it's puppets and then mentoring. <laughs> I really hope he listens to this podcast. I do too. I know he listens I to, to some. <laughs> I'm going to send it to him purposely. Be like, check this out. Trust me. <laughs> Scroll forward to yeah. 55 minutes in. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and if you do, Derek, I just want you to know I love you, buddy. That's You're right. This is this is from us. <laughs> That's right. Oh man. Well, dude, we've been talking for an hour already. That was super fast. Amazing. <laughs> this was so fun. Um, yes. Thanks for. Uh, chatting me up i'm glad you uh reached out this is fun yeah of course thanks for coming on so uh before i forget uh where can people find you online so yeah man my uh my uh instagram is v arid love it and i have a puppets and shit uh, instagram as well beautiful and uh facebook i think is the same and twitter is the same and uh i got a website that's under construction and i don't know google there Maybe. you go. Yeah, you're around. <laughs> That's right. I'm there. I'm somewhere on the internet. Yeah, you, you, got that, in. you got that SEO. Yeah, man. When you have a unique last name, like Yared is not super common, you just type my name out because something will come up. There you go. There you go. And watch Dark Crystal because <laughs> it's awesome. And you're up. Right? I love I Yeah, I love it. I'm super proud of that show. I hope people uh, get a chance to see it. Agreed. Agreed. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. 
You can also find me at brianbalance.com. That's balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows about a bunch of random things, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, JC, and Christina. Your support means so much to me, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.